Hey guys, it's Jay Steven, and I've been having a really good time revisiting the Chronicle of John of Joinville, uh, the life of St. Louis, which is primarily a chronicle of King Louis IX of France's crusade to Egypt, known as the Seventh Crusade to History. So this chronicle, it's written by John of Joinville, and John of Joinville was one of Louis's knights, and he's a very interesting guy because this chronicle he wrote is rather intimate for a medieval piece of writing. You really get a good picture of, of John and who he was, the sort of man he was, and he provides a lot of sort of slice of life type things, uh, little intimate details and uh, you know things from daily life that are just kind of interesting and kind of give you a, a glimpse more into the human aspect of what it was like uh, living in um, the 13th century medieval world. So yeah, it's, it's a very interesting book, and it's a very easy read, and I do recommend it highly. What I want to do today is just look at five things that I've pulled out of this chronicle as I've been revisiting it that I find interesting. Uh, just some incidents that uh, Jean wrote about that really stand out to me. I have the Penguin edition. We're going to jump to page 306 of that edition. And our first incident here is a group of Armenian pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem, visit King Louis IX of France while his army is encamped near Acre. Now, this took place in uh, 1253. So this is actually after the main action of the Seventh Crusade. You know, Louis's uh, crusade experienced its major defeat in 1250 when they were defeated in Egypt and uh, the king himself actually was captured and had to be ransomed. But in the four years after that, between 1251 and 1254, Louis remained in the uh, Crusader Kingdom there along the Palestinian and Syrian coast, you know, based in Accra, he remained and did a lot of things to shore up the defenses of the kingdom and just kind of get the kingdom's affairs in order. Let's go ahead and read this example here on page 306. After marching for several days, we arrived at the sands of Accra, where the king and his army encamped. While we were there, a large band of people from Great Armenia came to see me. They were going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem after paying a great sum as tribute to the Saracens who were conducting them there. By means of an interpreter who knew their language and ours, they begged me to show them the sainted king. I went to him and found him sitting in a pavilion, leaning against the central pole. He was seated on the bare sand without a carpet or anything else underneath him. Sir, said I, there is a huge troop of people from great Armenia outside here who are going to Jerusalem. They begged me to have our sainted king shown to them, but I have no desire as yet to kiss your bones. The king burst out laughing and told me to go and bring them in, which I did. When they had seen him, they commended him to God, and he returned their blessing. So a couple of things I find interesting about this little episode. First of all, we get a good idea of the famed piety of King Louis. Louis was pretty well known throughout the Christian world for being a, a, a very pious and uh, admirable ruler. And we can see here that these Armenians, uh, you know, this is from a, di a very distant country from France, of course, uh, these individuals uh, knew about this. And of course, his reputation was spreading in the East as a result of his crusade. He'd been there for some years now. And we also get, I think, a sense of the camaraderie that could exist between Latin and Eastern Christians, between Western and Eastern Christians. You know, because of the Fourth Crusade and all that sort of thing, there's kind of this tendency when we're studying the Crusades to make note of how there were these tensions that existed between the Eastern and Western Christian worlds. But I really think here that, you know, we don't want to overstate that. There was also a lot of mutual respect and sense of brotherhood between Eastern and Western Christians. And of course, the Latins of the West and the Armenians had a rather special relationship. Uh, this was probably the Eastern group that was closest to the Crusaders throughout their history, to the point where, in fact, the uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem, its royal house, became thoroughly intermingled with Armenian blood. There was Armenian royalty that married into the the uh, House of Jerusalem. And so, you know, like, for example, Queen Melisande was half Armenian, half uh, half Western. And we also get the sense of humor between uh, Jean and his king. 
And this is actually a reoccurring theme throughout this chronicle. Uh, Louis laughs a lot in this chronicle. He was a king who was uh, fairly lighthearted in terms of his uh, conduct between his, uh, his men uh, and his subjects and himself. And um, he, he enjoyed um, you know, a good joke. And, and in this case, uh, Jean was making a joke with Louis, you know, because these, he, he's almost saying, wow, I mean, these Armenians are almost treating you like you're, you're the relics of a saint. And you know, that was a thing in the, the medieval Christian world was that if you got close to a holy person, there was some value in that, some spiritual value in that. And Louis was already kind of gaining a reputation for saintliness throughout the Christian world. But, you know, Jean made this little joke about, you know, but, you know, I, I don't want to see you dead yet, you know, sire. And, and Louis laughs at that. He finds that amusing. It just kind of shows that this was a king who, he was close to his men, he was close to his knights, close to his subjects, and um, was willing to, to be lighthearted in his interactions with them. And I also think we get a sense of Louis's charitableness and uh, kind of his humble attitude. You know, he was perfectly willing to, to meet with these these Christian pilgrims just passing through. All right, our next incident here is going to continue with the theme of lightheartedness and good humor among uh, Louis's men. This is uh, on pages 310 through 11, and this is a knight who enjoys pranks. So both of these incidents actually happened while Louis was traveling to the city of Sidon. One of the things that Louis did in those four years after his defeat in Egypt is he refortified or improved on the fortifications of these various coastal cities in the Crusader Kingdom of Outremer. Um, he did that at Accra, and he did a major uh, renovation and fortification project at the city of Sidon. This is Jean. I must tell you here of some amusing tricks the Comte de Hue played on us. I had made a sort of house for myself in which my knights and I used to eat, sitting so as to get the light from the door, which, as it happened, faced the Comte de Hue's quarters. The Count, who was a very ingenious fellow, had rigged up a miniature ballistic machine with which he could throw stones into my tent. He would watch us as we were having our meal, adjust his machine to suit the length of our table, and then let fly at us, breaking our pots and glasses. So first of all, again, this theme of a lighthearted sense of humor and good nature among the knights of Louis's army. This is actually a Count who, um, I, I, I guess what Jean is saying here is he made this little miniature uh, catapult and was was uh, launching some some little stones into the little dining area he had set up uh, for him and his men. And of course, uh, Louis's men, his his knights, his his high ranking knights were also going to have their own households around them. So Jean had his own group of knights who kind of were his his men. So that's what's going on here. So again, we get kind of this lighthearted sense of humor. Uh, you know, this, this guy was kind of made this little toy that he was using to kind of prank his buddy. Um, you know, these, these are high-ranking men in uh, the Kingdom of France, but um, uh, there was a certain camaraderie among them to where they enjoyed, you know, a little bit of humor with each other. And also, you know, take note that this is a keenly militaristic sense of humor. You know, he makes this little catapult. You know, these are men who, this is their profession, is catapults and sieges and that kind of thing. And so... Uh, this is the kind of thing that they would find amusing. The next episode we have here is on pages 3, 11 through 12, and this is The Folly of Hoarding Treasure. What John says here is this is a story that was told to him. He says here, While the king was fortifying Sidon, certain merchants came to the camp and told us how the king of the Tartars, now that's the Mongols, had taken Baghdad and captured the religious leader of the Saracens who ruled over the city and went by the title of Caliph of Baghdad. Okay, now, the Mongol conquest of Baghdad took place in 1258. The period of time that Jean is writing about is between 1253 and 1254. And Jean actually wrote this chronicle quite a few years later. You know, one has to wonder if he kind of misremembered when he heard about this story because um, you know there's no way that he could have heard about this from merchants while he was uh, in the Holy Land because uh, Baghdad didn't fall until several years after this happened but anyway it's kind of interesting 
So we'll go ahead and read the the incident. Now, this incident that that John is talking about is the Mongols have captured Baghdad and they have the the Muslim ruler of Baghdad uh, as as their prisoner. And he says, so as to cover up his treachery and throw the blame for the capture of the city on the caliph, the king of the Mongols had given orders for the latter to be taken and put into an iron cage where he was kept as short of food as a man can be without actually dying of starvation. The king had then asked him if he was hungry, the king of the Mongols. The caliph had said he was, which was not to be wondered at. So the king of the Mongols had had a great golden dish loaded with jewels and precious stones brought before his captive, and had asked him, Do you recognize these jewels? The other had replied, Yes, they were mine. The Mongol king had asked him if he prized them very much, and the caliph had told him that he did. At this, the Mongol king had said, Since you value them so highly, take as much as you like of these jewels you see here and eat. The caliph had replied that he could not, since they were not food, such as could be eaten. Thereupon the Mongol king had said to him, You may now see what might have been your means of defense. For if you had distributed your treasure, which at this moment is of no use to you, among your men-at-arms, you might, by spending it thus, have defended yourself successfully against us, whereas now it fails you in your hour of greatest need. Okay, so this is interesting just because this gives us a sense of medieval political thinking. Uh, the wise distribution of resources among one's men is better than hoarding wealth. And this was a kind of a common theme in the medieval world. First of all, I just want to say that did this happen? You know, did uh, the Mongol king actually put the uh, Muslim ruler of Baghdad in a cage and offer him to eat his jewels? I mean, it's, you know, it sounds kind of like one of those tall tales that gets passed around along the trade routes in the medieval world. Of course, it is absolutely true that the Mongols annihilated Baghdad for the most part, absolutely wrecked havoc there, slaughtered huge numbers of people. So that part is true. But really what's important here about this story isn't so much the circumstances of the tale, but sort of what the tale tells us about how people thought in the medieval world. The person who just hoards his wealth and sits on it is setting himself up for problems because his, his men aren't going to be paid well. Uh, his troops are going to not be faithful to him. Today, we have this idea of, of saving, whereas that idea wasn't so meaningful in the medieval world where, you know, uh, the economy wasn't really based on currency uh, to the degree that it is today. A successful king or ruler was somebody who, who spent his money and he spent it well, especially he spent it on his, his troops or, or he bought the right things. This is one of the things that uh, Richard the Lionheart was so praised for as he was so good at uh, his use of resources. Uh, that's how he was able to be so successful in the Third Crusade. So this is just kind of a, a cautionary tale um, about how how the foolish ruler is the one who kind of hoards his jewels and then, you know, he gets defeated in, in a war. And then what good is this hoard of wealth he had? You know, the true source of your power in the medieval world comes from your, your followers, from your men. So that's how you are effective. Um, you, you're generous. The, uh, the truly successful ruler is someone who is generous with his men. All right, our next example is on page 313 through 14. And this is, the children of a poor knight receive patronage. So let's read this. And this is still during this period when uh, Louis was refortifying Sidon. On All Saints Day, I invited all the chief men in the camp to my quarters, which were by the sea. While we were at dinner, a poor knight and his wife with their four children arrived in a ship. I gave them a meal in my quarters. After we had finished eating, I called together all my important guests and said to them, let's perform a deed of charity and relieve this poor man of his children, each of you taking charge of one while I take one myself. They each agreed to take one and quarreled as to who should have which. On seeing this, the poor knight and his wife began to weep for joy. It so happened that as the Comte de U was coming back from dining with the king, he stopped to look in on the men I had with me and took away the child I had taken. 
who was about 12 years old. This lad served the Count so well and faithfully that after we had returned to France, his master arranged a marriage for him and made him a knight. Every time I happened to be in the same place as the Count, this knight could scarcely keep away from me and used to say to me repeatedly, May God reward you, my lord, for I owe all this honor I enjoy to you. All right, so a couple of really interesting things about this little episode. First of all, this shows us the lot of a lower tier knight who did not have sponsorship. So there was different levels of the nobility uh, in, in the 13th century. You know, if, uh, the king actually himself was a knight. Below him, he had his, his, his great men and they had knights below them. And then e each of these uh, levels of men would receive patronage from, from his lord. You know, the very lowest level of knights would be something kind of like a household knight. This is a knight who just serves in the household of, of a nobleman and receives his income from him, uh, receives his, his, uh, his livelihood from him, and you know, serves in his military following. So this is a knight who arrives. He, he doesn't have a lord like that, so he, he's a poor man. Uh, although, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's of the nobility on some level. He's a knight. He's been knighted before. You know, once you're knighted, you can't, uh, that, that never goes away from you. You're a knight. Um, and nobility, of course, is something you're born with. But knighting, of course, is a separate ceremony that, that bestows yet another honor on a man. And, uh, you know, we don't know how it is this man is not sponsored at this time, but, you know, he's, he arrives in poverty. Um, a nobleman's children made their way in the world by joining a reputable household. So the nobility, you know, their children would, would often leave their household fairly early because they would go to make their, their way in the world by joining the household of maybe someone who is of higher rank than their, their parent. Um, maybe it would be a great relative. You know, perhaps you have an uncle who's a lord somewhere. So you're going to go at, at his household and you're going to be, be a, a page there and learn uh, the beginning ropes of, of knighthood as, as, a, as a boy, and then you become a squire, you know, who's, who's kind of the, uh, the sidekick of a knight. You know, he, he does uh, the most important support work that a, that a knight needs. And then hopefully, you know, you can become a knight and maybe you'll, you'll get uh, a marriage. You'll be married to, uh, to an heiress who, ha who has maybe a little fife of land or something. That's kind of how you can make your way in the world. So we can see how the children of, of this, this, this knight uh, would be in kind of a difficult situation because their father is, is impoverished and they don't have you know, a sponsorship. So this is an example of kind of how medieval networking worked you know, in some circumstances. I mean, this is kind of a particularly desperate situation for, for this knight. But um, you know, Jean is doing something, he, and he says explicitly, this is something charitable he wants to do. He wants to do something kind of out of Christian brotherly love for this man. He wants to help him out. And um, it's kind of interesting because he says, you know, uh, let's let's take, uh, what's he saying? Um, let's uh, relieve this poor man of his children, you know? <laughs> to our modern ears, that sounds kind of like, what, what he's going to take his children from him? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that upset him? And the, the parents weep for joy, you know, <laughs> when, when they find that uh, Jean is offering to do this. Well, he's not saying he's taking his children from them. He's, he's giving his children uh, sponsorship. This is a very good thing for this man's children. Another thing that's kind of interesting is this knight is married. I think there's this idea that floats around sometimes that sort of the lowest tier knights, you know, just a household knight, would not be married because he doesn't have lands of his own. He's attached to another man with lands. Not always the case, you know, especially um, as the medieval world went on, this was less and less the case um, as we get into the 13th century, especially. And then also, I think it's interesting, Jean tells us about what happens when uh, the young man who he sponsored grows up, uh, he ends up serving in, in the household of one of the greatest uh, uh, men in France. He says that, you know, from then on when he ran into this young man, he's like, you know, thank you so much for what you did for me when I was a child. He is married to an heiress and he, uh, he you know, he gets uh, titles of his own. And that brings us to our final little example here from the life of St. Louis. And this is on page 315. And this is Louis IX grieves the death of his mother, Queen Blanche. Uh, anybody who knows anything about Louis IX will know that his mother remained an important part of his life and administration well into adulthood. Uh, Blanche of Castile, who actually uh, administered the kingdom while Louis was on crusade. Uh, Queen Blanche dies while Louis is on crusade. This is in the 1253-1254. Uh, you know, Queen Blanche dies. Louis gets word of it. So here we go. It was while he was inside on that the king received news of his mother's death. 
Oh, it says here, uh, Queen Blanche died in November of 1252. So the news just arrives slowly. Uh, it was 1253 before Louis knew about this. He, that's King, uh, King Louis, was so prostrated with grief that for two whole days no one could speak to him. After that, he sent one of the servants of his household to summon me. When I came into his presence and found him sitting all alone in his room, he stretched out his arms to me as soon as he saw me and said, Ah, Senchel, I have lost my mother. Sir, said I, this news does not astonish me since she had to die, but I'm surprised that you, who are a wise man, should show such grief at this event. For as you know, a certain sage philosopher has said that whatever grief a man may feel in his heart, nothing of it should appear on his face, because by showing his grief he gives his enemies cause for joy and brings distress to his friends. The king had many fine services held for the queen mother over sea, and subsequently sent to France a chest full of letters addressed to all the churches, asking them to pray for her soul. So this is interesting here. First, again, we get this openness between Jean and the king. Jean is willing to tell the king he disapproves of his behavior. This is typical of Louis's reign. Louis encouraged this sort of openness and honesty among his men. He wanted his men to be close to him, to feel that they could talk openly with him. He wasn't one of those kings who wanted everybody to kiss his, his, his butt or, you know, off with your head type thing. In fact, that was rare in this era in the medieval world. Uh, in the world of Henry VIII, that was kind of a thing. Back here in the 13th century, that was not so common, and especially among, a, a, and spe especially for a king like Louis, who was, who was uh, very concerned above all about, uh, you know, good conduct and being a, a good Christian. So he, he did not want to be an arrogant um, king, and, and also, and he wanted his men to feel um, a, a sense of camaraderie with him. You know, his his high-ranking knights were like his friends. Uh, Jean of Joinville was very much like one of Louis the Ninth's close friends, and we can see that here. You know, when, when John uh, comes into the king's room, you know, John uh, throws out his arms to embrace, or I'm sorry, Louis throws out his, his arms to embrace John. Uh, he says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm in a really bad state. He's being open with his friend. John disapproves of Louis' kind of open grief here. Now, anybody who spends much time studying the medieval world, you'll run across this concept uh, frequently. This idea that when you're going through a horrible crisis, you know, a period of, of desolation and sadness. You shouldn't really uh, show too much open grief. So this is this idea that, you know, a ruler should be stoic. Louis, I guess, is more comfortable kind of showing his grief. But it's an interesting idea, and it's one that's, that's reoccurring uh, throughout the medieval world. And also, I, I like here this interesting little tidbit. John says, uh, the news of her death doesn't surprise me because we all must die. Again, kind of more of a, a medieval attitude about death. You know, we kind of treat, um, you know, death was something that people faced more often in, uh, in the medieval world. You know, today death is kind of, in, in our world today, we face death when, you know, our parents die and that sort of thing when they're, they're elderly. But, you know, if, if a, a child dies or, you know, a lot of other incidents of death are kind of, you know, greeted with shock and this is such an unprecedented tragedy. But, this is something that people faced more often in the Middle Ages. So anyway, just some interesting stuff there. So I hope you enjoyed this little look at a few incidents from the life of St. Louis by Jean of Joinville. And I hope you will check this chronicle out. It's, it's very interesting and it's, it's a very compelling uh, book and it's very easy to read. So thanks. The sky hangs cold and the siege grows old And here she lay dying Father take her soul In her eyes gray I see all our days Her sins they were few The Puri calls home soon cross she sewed on my circle 